Welcome back to 12 Days in March. In this third installment on electrophysiology, Dr. McInnes will resume his discussion, starting with some background information on the cardiac rhythm disturbances before launching into a focused review of the antiarrhythmic agent. So, with no further ado, let's pick up the discussion. We're going to shift gears now a little bit. We're going to focus on heart rhythm disturbances and, in particular, antiarrhythmic drugs and sort of how those two things go, you know, go together. I'm sure you're all aware of this, but basic identification of sort of a limited number of heart rhythm abnormalities from a cardiac rhythm strip is sort of expected on step one. We'll show, I'll show you kind of the high yield arrhythmias today, and then definitely they do they love uh, certain antiarrhythmic drugs for various reasons. So, again, you don't need to understand every different heart rhythm, but you do need to understand the pathophysiology and pharmacology related to these different rhythm abnormalities. So, hopefully by now this is somewhat second nature to everybody. You remember that a standard cardiac cycle, when depicted electrically, involves that P wave, which uh, represents atrial depolarization, the QRS complex, which is the big electrically involved ventricular depolarization, and then the T wave, which represents ventricular repolarization. Uh, and of course, we don't get to see electrically the atrial repolarization process because it's small and buried within the QRS complex. Okay. There's a couple of, of intervals also, in addition to sort of just knowing the waves. There's a couple of intervals that you might be asked a little bit about. So there's this PR interval, which represents the beginning of atrial depolarization until the beginning of ventricular depolarization. The QRS duration, so basically the QRS duration is a measurement of how much time it takes for the ventricular myocardium to depolarize. And then the QT interval is the sort of total summation of time between the beginning of ventricular depolarization until ventricular repolarization has sort of wrapped up. So the total amount of time that the ventricle is undergoing these ion flows. And that's uh, important because there's a lot of drugs that alter this process and in, the, in and of themselves predisposed to ventricular uh, electrical problems, most specifically arrhythmias. So cardiac arrhythmias, they come in two varieties, fast and slow. So we'll start with the Brady arrhythmias. These are fairly straightforward to understand. This is a situation where the heart rate is too slow, and it can essentially be one of two problems. Either there's an, an issue with the generation of electrical impulses, which generally implies that there's a problem with the sinus node, or there's a problem with conduction of those impulses, like a block in the atrioventricular node or some issue with the his Purkinje system. So either you're not starting enough or you're not conducting enough. Why does this happen? By far, the most common scenario is age-related degeneration, what we call fibrocalcific degeneration of the myocardium. So that's the, that is by far the most common cause for bradyarrhythmias, but there's definitely plenty of other things. And on the, the boards, they love to kind of think about these sort of oddball causes. So drug effects can definitely do it if the patient is on some you know, huge dose of, say, a tenolol, and that could certainly do it. Hypothyroidism is a great example. You know, the patient's bradycardic, but you're also reading a description about how they uh, have kind of slowed speech and they're hypothermic, that sort of thing. That can do it. Lyme disease, oh, they love this, right? A woman like faints on the pier from Nantucket. Bam, you're ready to go. Lyme <laughs> disease, right? Okay, how do we treat this? Well, if there's some underlying cause for bradycardia, then drug effect, hypothyroid, you know, you can tr treat that and the problem will generally correct itself. Uh, otherwise, you generally need a, a pacemaker. If there's something that's not reversible, uh, the patient's going to require a pacemaker. That's really the only long-term therapy for bradycardia. So here is one example of complete heart block. I think this is the only bradyarrhythmia that they're really likely to, to show you. Heart blocks come in all these different varieties. You may have, have recall or have heard of, like first degree, second degree, all this sort of thing. All, I think, for this phase, all you really need to know is that Complete heart block is a scenario where there is no reliable communication between the atria, which are those P waves, and the QRS complex. Lyme disease absolutely can give you complete heart block. So in a younger person, it certainly could be Lyme. In an, in an older person, it's almost always that person is sort of vectoring towards a pacemaker. So, all right, let's talk about tachyarrhythmias. So this is a scenario where the heart rate is too fast. And basically, you can think of tachyarrhythmias as having two main mechanisms, which this is a bit of an oversimplification, but in general, there's two main ways that you get a tachyarrhythmia. 
You can have something called an automatic tachycardia. That's basically a scenario where we have an area of tissue within the myocardium that is firing rapidly, and we'll talk about why that might be. Or you can have something called a reentrant arrhythmia, which is a scenario where somehow you have a region within the myocardium that is able to support a circular snake chasing its tail type of electrical loop, and we'll show a diagram uh, about that. So let's talk about automatic tachycardia. So again, this is a focal area within the heart. It's depolarizing at a rapid rate. Uh, the best way to think about this, or the simplest example, is just sinus tachycardia. You go, you run on the treadmill, your heart rate goes up to you know, 140. You know, you, your body needs the cardiac output. Your sinus node responds by ramping everything up. The sinus node is firing. There you go. That's, uh, that's it. There are other examples, though. So you can have something called an atrial tachycardia. There are some rare forms of ventricular tachycardia that can be automatic in nature. So there can be a few other examples. When do we see automatic tachycardias? A lot of times it's in the setting of uh, some kind of severe systemic illness, especially if that systemic illness involves uh, lung disease. When the lungs are unhappy, that kind of predisposes people to having especially atrial automatic tachycardias. If the atria themselves get dilated for some reason, big sort of stretched out atria, those are uh, often a scenario where there can be some scarring and predisposition to uh, an atrial tachyarrhythmia. Hyperthyroidism, if the, if the thyroid is really active, that can kind of set you up for this. Basically, the treatment for this kind of issue, for the most part, it's beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. You're, you, we use those drugs to just kind of suppress the automatic action that is driving this kind of process. If someone has an automatic tachycardia and it really, it's not going away and there's not something sort of reversible that can be corrected and it's not responding adequately to medication, uh, ablation would be an option. So those are automatic tachycardias. In contrast, and frankly, a much more common phenomenon, are what we call re-entrant arrhythmias. So here, re-entry is a somewhat complicated but relatively important concept. For step one, I don't think it's necessary that, that you like, have a total understanding of sort of all the nuances of reentry, but you do need to understand that reentry is important in a lot of different arrhythmias, and it plays a big role in antiarrhythmic drugs, the whole reason that we use antiarrhythmic drugs. And another sort of name or phrase for reentry is uh, called circus movement tachycardias, and I kind of like that, that description just because it, it does sort of highlight exactly what's going on. So in reentry, you have some scenario where you have a, a common electrical entry point and a common electrical exit point, and you have what I fondly refer to as a donut diagram here. You have basically two limbs, one that are divided by some sort of island of uh, tissue in between. So when electricity comes in, when a wavefront of depolarization comes up to this fork in the road, it does take it, as Yogi Berra says, it can go both ways, and having this present anatomically allows for the possibility under pathologic circumstances for a wave of depolarization to wind up doing this kind of circular thing and running round, around and round and around. We're not gonna belabor you know, the exact details. The key thing, again, the, the key points are just that you have this kind of uh, common entry and exit point, these two limbs, the limbs are slightly different from one another, and that creates the possibility of this uh, rapid circling around the loop. So what are some examples of reentrant uh, arrhythmias? So Wolf Parkinson white tachycardia, the boards love WPW. There's a phenomenon called AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, where that donut diagram lives within the AV node itself. Atrial flutter is a scenario where you have that, that donut phenomenon that lives around the tricuspid valve. Um, so that can occur. Most ventricular tachycardias uh, are reentrant arrhythmias. So these are pretty common and significant arrhythmias where reentry plays an important role. So that's all very interesting, but why do we really care? Well, in addition to the fact that these things are important from a clinical sort of standpoint, antiarrhythmic drugs, they work by changing the electrical properties of a reentrant loop with the goal that circular snake chasing its tail phenomenon with the goal that this cannot happen. So an antiarrhythmic drug essentially poisons ion flows really throughout the body, but especially in the heart. And you're doing that all so that some little tiny donut someplace, hopefully, 
is, is altered in such a way that it can no longer support this rapid, you know, circular type of movement. And an ablation procedure, similarly as what we discussed before, if, if you can find this loop, you can do an ablation and you can burn it, and then the patient maybe does not need an antiarrhythmic drug. So that's the other option for how you can treat one of these reentrant tachycardias. And that'll do it for this presentation. In the remaining two videos, Dr. McGinnis will take on the topic of antiarrhythmic drugs. Stay tuned.